Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us in the series of presentations, which is to inform viewers about the power of automation. I'm Pat Brands, freelance journalist, and I'm here with Martin Holbert, technical director of Ignite Technology. Hi, good morning. Okay, so Martin, what kinds of challenges are we going to address today? So today we're going to look around the problems organizations face around creating resilient, reliable processes within their organization, uh, especially when they're dependent on IT infrastructure. Um, specifically, you know, anything that could be an application, a database, a file even, a web service, a mainframe, or in the cloud. Okay. So let me ask you a basic question because it's always good to start out on the same page. What exactly is a workload? Yeah, so it's a good question. And honestly, the, the interesting thing about that is the workload is actually what we automate. Um, so it's actually the, the product of what we put together from those tasks that we can pick out from an organization that we need to um, automate and process through. And the workload is actually the, the result, if you like. It's the thing that the automation engine is actually running through. So that workload is the computation of all the tasks that we've put in. Um, so it's it's an interesting concept. It's actually what, what we create at the end rather than what we find in the beginning. Okay. And what is workload automation? So the uh, the concept of workload automation is is taking that workload that we've created, um, so that set of tasks or schedules or whatever it is that we need to to automate, and actually running that through a, an automation engine autonomously with, with as minimum human amount of uh, intervention as possible. Um, so we can build in intelligent schedules, we can allow for maintenance, we can create workflows that have remediation, for example. And the whole idea is to really limit the amount of human touch that's going on. Um, and so the system is running autonomously, running those workloads for us. Okay. And final basic question is what is service orchestration? Yeah, and, and service orchestration really builds on workload automation in, in a lot of respects, because when we say service orchestration, what we're really talking about is taking a, a business process or a service that the business requires um, and actually automating that through the workload automation engine. So that could be something, for example, such as an employee onboarding, which obviously involves multiple different tasks and systems along the way. So, you know, perhaps we've got Active Directory, we've got uh, HR systems and other systems that the employee needs access to, maybe some training material that needs to be created and spun up for that particular employee. It's taking that and it's taking that service. So looking at it from the service point of view and turning it into a load of automation workflows that then enable that service to happen. Okay, that makes sense. What are some of the misconceptions about workload automation and service orchestration? So I think one of the, the primary misconceptions is simply our organization is too complicated. It's not possible. You know, we can't automate what we do. It's too complicated for anything to do that. And that just simply isn't true because if you boil any process down or anything that's happening within an organization, there's always a, a way of following things. There's always logic to what's going on. Uh, might be hard to find, of course, but that's why we we have to run um, design and things like that through to actually get to the the end result. But you know that is a common misconception that the things are far too complicated. Um, another one is that you know going through all of that effort is not worth it. You know why would we put this tool in? What's what's the result for us at the end of the day? Um, you know, and as, as these uh, the sort of series of videos we're putting out are about, it's about actually. There is a lot to gain. There is a lot to gain from this in terms of time, money, reliability, resilience, you know, all of these things that are a hot on topic for, for everyone at the moment. Um, and sort of a final thing that I'll just touch on is just it takes people's jobs away, which is obviously not what you know anyone wants to hear. Uh, but obviously, I tend to look at this as a, as a more positive light of it actually enables people to get on with their jobs because often we find people are drawn into things which you know, they shouldn't really be having to do day to day because they're trying to keep something propped up or um, taking a lot of time processing something through manually. We free them up to do more valuable tasks for the organization. Well, that's good news. Um, how long have workload automation and service orchestration been in existence? Yeah, so this is nothing new. It's been around for decades. You know, the concept has been around for a long time. Um, it started back in the, the sort of days of task scheduling. So, you know, back in sort of mainframe and original task schedulers. 
Um, and it's really grown on top of that because simple task schedulers you know, have their limits. They, they only sit in certain places. They generally tend to be schedule driven. Um, so workload automation really stemmed from, from that and took it to the next level in terms of um, stemming out into bringing systems together, uh, having event driven schedules instead, uh, having multiple schedules over the top of each other. Um, so really it built on a more on from those foundations a much more complicated um system which can work with organizations across the board okay what's new about workload automation and service orchestration today i, I think one of the main things that's been coming out um over the recent years has really been around web services uh, so in the past we've we've had to have uh, agents as we call them which connect to actual systems so you have a system for a, a agent for a application. Um, I think REST APIs and, and web service APIs have really opened up the door to allow us to connect to multiple things. And that brings us kind of on to the next thing, which is is really at the moment um, heart of what we're doing at the moment, which is around cloud automation. Um, so, you know, APIs are key to that. Uh, and we're talking not only automating the cloud um, uh, that, you know, customers might have be that, uh, say GCP, AWS, Azure. Um, we're also talking about obviously SaaS platforms as well, which you know are becoming far more important to businesses as we move forwards. But they are disparate; they are disconnected from the on-premise um, environment. And I think the the web services has enabled that to to kind of be clawed back a bit into the 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 reaching the touch points of the automation platform. Okay. Can you describe some use cases and industries that illustrate what you're talking about? Yeah, so there's um, various different use cases. It's really any kind of repeatable digital task that it is in existence or process. So you can have um, someone perhaps uploading a file of data that's being brought in from somewhere. We can have a data pipeline, for example, bringing data into data warehouses, we can have SAP is a, is a very big use case of this, where we have multiple SAP tasks and jobs that are then dependent on systems that sit outside of that. So we orchestrate SAP um, and automate the workloads that are coming in and out of that. Um, we have sort of utility companies that can use it for billing purposes, gathering up smart meter readings, financial uh, customers using it for uh, bringing across transactions and creating financial regulatory, regulatory reports. Um, and we have educational services who all use it for spinning up training environments, um, creating all the the uh, pieces that someone needs in the background off of a click on a website, for example. Um, they can be complicated to, to the point of spinning up virtual machines, databases, all the pieces that someone needs to, to do some training. So there's a real wide variety of use cases available. Right. And what are the challenges that are solved and what are these challenges costing organizations? I think the, the main challenge is really stem back to um, resilience and human error and also cost. So we have the the fact that, you know, people are people, you know, humans are humans. They make mistakes. They can't repeat a task over and over again with absolute error free um, results. So mistakes enter into into the system. We don't want that. So automating that takes away that risk of human error. We have with that with the resilience. So a system that tends to be far more resilient than people in terms of making sure things happen and are done on time. Um, and we also have the kind of cost element of that. So there's obviously people who have to do that. They cost money. But also there's the cost of errors. Errors cost money as well. Um, and also one of the other things that automation brings in terms of solving challenges is around remediation so when there's sla issues or when something is occurring that causes a problem further down the chain um, in one of the workflows we can remediate against that and suddenly now we can save a load of time and effort in trying to correct that after the fact we can get ahead of it and actually correct it before it happens or at least be aware that it's going to happen and then remediate against that so they're the key reasons why we would try and do this Right. And to do this, there must be some tools, and I'm sure you can talk about that. What kinds of tools are used for workload automation and service or orchestration? 
so the products we generally use for this are workload automation engines. Um, so they, they are tools specifically designed for this purpose. They're designed to run against the central um, system, which are, you know, I quite like to think of this as a bit of a spider. So that, that's the body of the spider. The legs then extend out into what we call agents, which then sit on all the things that we need to automate. Um, and that engine then essentially is what is running all of the workload automation and service orchestration. Um, so th those platforms exist. They've existed for, a, for quite some time. Um, they've been incredibly widely used to um, automate across mainframe, Oracle Retail, SAP, you know, the, large and the large applications in most organizations that you would find. Um, and I think now the the focus is really, as I say, turning towards um, using them for their, their web service capabilities instead and branching out into all areas of the business. Do those tools have to integrate with legacy applications? Yeah, so a lot of the times that's where they've come from. So they've come from that kind of SAP, Oracle Retail, mainframe background. Um, we have specific uh, connectors for those, if you like, that have, have grown up um, that we had to use for those. Obviously, if we have um, a tool that we don't have something for right now, but it doesn't have an API, that that's an interesting challenge. Um, but there's always a way around it. We can also talk to um, operating systems. We can talk to databases and we can talk to files. So there's plenty of different ways that we can um, actually use this. But for most part, you know, we're, we're talking these days about using the APIs as a preferred method. But certainly the legacy applications exist as um, pre prepackaged um, connectors. What does a project look like? I'm sure you don't just go out and buy this. We talked about last time. You don't just go buy this at the grocery store, but you must run a project. What does that look like to implement workload automation and service orchestration? Yeah, no, I think like last time, this is very much a similar topic. Um, we really looking at a design phase, um, so working out what is it, what is it we actually want to bring in um before that we'll obviously have a scope so we'll work out the scope of what we want to bring in and that can be you know small to start with and then working our way towards bringing more and more systems in as it makes sense there's generally going to be critical applications where we're going to see a big benefit big value for money bringing a tool like this in first and they may be um for example you know we've had customers where They've had uh, APIs which are unreliable. So they require action each time something happens to them. And it can be as simple to start with as taking that and just taking the actions they run when they don't work. So the tool then works out that they haven't worked and it works it out when that happens, runs the remediation, which in this case was actually just restarting the nodes. Um, and then it reruns the process. But now suddenly, not only have you taken out six hours where nothing was working because no one realizes and then someone goes and, and kicks it and gets it going again. But you also then, you know, have also created this uh, much more resilient, streamlined process as well. So we're, we're saving time everywhere, basically. OK, now. Um... That's that, that sounds really good. Uh, what about the future? Where do you see this going? What's the future of workload automation and service orchestration? Yeah, so I think this has been changing a lot with the technology um, that's been going along. So as I say, the web services, cloud, they're the, they're the things at the moment. I, I think another key player for me with workload automation um, is going to be around AI because as that gets better, the abilities of these products to remediate and self-remediate, but also to analyze the data that's coming from them, because that's the other key benefit we get from um, automating something that was manual is we start to get statistics. So we start to understand what our workloads actually look like, how long they take. And we use that currently in the current form to understand when things are about to go wrong. So we use it to predictively understand already okay, this is taking longer than it should do. It looks like it's probably going to overrun and that's going to blow my SLAs, you know, maybe five steps down the line because I'm going to miss a deadline for a report that's going out, for example. And I think that will only grow. And I'm quite excited to see what the future holds here in terms of 
how far we can push the AI capabilities to actually, you know, almost get to the levels of where a, a real person sitting and looking at these things and saying, oh, that's kind of done that. I feel like I should do this. And if we could build that into this platform so that it can self-remediate as well as take the remediation actions we've given it as well, um, that I think would be very exciting. So thanks, Martin. That was very informative. And I, and thank you uh, for, for joining us uh, to view this. Remember, this is a series of presentations where we inform people about the power of automation. And look for the next few videos. We look forward to seeing you there.